We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to a new episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and we are recording this show Thursday night, April 25th, 2024. For many of you, it's all about the NFL draft as the Chicago Bears got themselves a franchise quarterback and wide receiver in the first round. We aren't going to talk about the Bears, even though that would be a lot more fun. No, we're going to talk about the 3-22 and Chicago White Sox who go winless on their road trip to Philadelphia and Minneapolis. And it wasn't all that competitive. In the seven games, they were outscored 49-18. to Nothing is working for the White Sox. That idea of playing better defense and focusing on run prevention, the White Sox have allowed six or more runs in seven straight games. That idea of having better plate discipline and draw more walks. The White Sox are dead last in Major League Baseball with a 266 on base percentage. The White Sox now join the 1988 Baltimore Orioles, the 2003 Detroit Tigers, and the 2022 Cincinnati Reds, for the worst 25 game starts to a season. Their 56 runs scored through 25 games is the fifth fewest in MLB history through 25 games. White Sox fans, you have never seen a worse start to a season in your life. So the question is getting raised. What's going to change? One would think Pedro Grafal's status as manager with him knowing his seat is getting hotter. That's where we'll start. James Fegan is on his way back home from Minneapolis as we record this show. So joining me is the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It's Jim Margulis. And Jim, in a way, it's not that hard to believe the White Sox are playing this bad, being 3-22. and But man, this is really bad. It is hard to believe. I think 3-22 and is hard to believe. I think that's the definition of just like even the A's last year. Uh, worst team ever, people thought. Uh, they fell short of that, but like, you know, they had everything going for them in terms of the major league losing on purpose, killing interest on purpose, everything like that. And they were still slightly better. I think they're like five and 19 at this point. So I think three and 22 is pretty unbelievable. Uh, I, I think the root causes of it are pretty believable. Like I think all the individual failures or group failures, unit failures, if you want to call it like starting pitching bullpen, et cetera, like the timing of it where like they get a game lined up for their best relievers and they fail like, you know, that's that's an extra kick, but also like believable in isolation that their high leverage guys might squander one opportunity. It just happened to be like the one opportunity they got this month. So like, yeah, it, it's both uh, plausible and just like thoroughly uh, ludicrous <laughs> the way it's happening. And yeah, I, I'm of the mind right now that if they're going to be this bad, like continue to be this bad because people are interested, kind of like the Detroit Pistons were earlier this year, like when they were, <laughs> was it 0-28 or 29 losses in a row, something like that? I forget how many, but, you know, they had people uh, 
you know, first gawking at them and making fun of them and then feeling sorry for them and then feeling happy for them when they won and all the close calls, like that was interesting. And then, you know, the Pistons faded from relevance and that's not really like, you know, a knock on them because, you know, if, if we're Bulls fans and I'm speaking as one, like, you know, the, the, the Bulls really aren't that much better when it comes to like big picture stuff. But still, uh, just like when they're this bad, people still want to pay attention. It's only when they get to be like 55 loss kind of bad like the Royals were last year that people have seen it before. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Just, uh, you know, it's fascinating just how awful it is. At the 25 game mark, Jim, those Chicago White Sox are already 15 games behind Cleveland in the American League Central. They're eight and a half games back of fourth place of the Minnesota Twins. And you pulled up a stat as well when you're writing the game recap. What's the home run difference right now between the White Sox and their opponents? It is 38 to 14. A 24 home run difference in the first 25 games of the season. Like, when are the White Sox going to hit their 38th home run of the season? Like, I keep thinking, like, they have to win. If they win 18 in a row, they'll still be under 500. And that would set a franchise... Record, right? Longest winning streak? I believe so, yeah. It's only April. Uh, That's what we're talking about here. Like, that's the depths to which they have sunk. Well, with how bad it's been for the Chicago White Sox, it does bring to question Pedro Gafal's job status. As I mentioned in our previous podcast on Monday, I said it very clearly. If the White Sox get swept by the Minnesota Twins, I think the White Sox need to fire Pedro Gafal. They got swept by the Minnesota Twins. However... From our reporting from James Fegan, Chris Getz did not travel with the team to Minneapolis. Now, Chris Getz is expected to speak with the media before Friday's game. But James did get a chance to ask questions to Pedro Gafal after this game about his job security. And Pedro Gafal said, quote, last year we went through it in the middle of the year. I said it. This is on the manager. This is on me. It is what it is. It's part of the job. You don't take this job thinking, oh man, maybe there's pressure. Maybe there's no pressure. You take the job knowing there's pressure. It just comes with the job, end quote. And that was what Grafal said to the question about his job status. And Grafal's record now as manager of the Chicago White Sox is 64 and 123. That's a 342 winning percentage. And in that media scrum with Chris Getz before Friday's game, Jim, I hope James gets a chance to raise this question that he wrote in his column on SoxMachine.com. When do the results become unacceptable for Chris Getz and the Chicago White Sox? Because I assume Getz is going to rave about the team's work ethic and how much everyone's getting along in the clubhouse. And then eventually the results will come because of their hard work. But when is that limit for the Chicago White Sox? Do you have any guesses on when that limit could possibly be? (laughs) I was just thinking of the, I think it was Will Omen who was released on the road and like, you know, just picturing Chris Getz being there. Like everybody who's getting on the team playing, raise your hand. Not so, not so fast, Pedro. Like uh, step back. Uh, Yeah. We've arranged a car for you to drive back from Minneapolis. Uh, Please reimburse us when you get back. Um, Yeah. It's, it's got to be pretty bad. Like I'm thinking of like how, you know, what would be the red line in terms of like what gets in the front office isn't getting out of the season. One would be just like if Jerry Reinsdorf has like a firm date in mind, like we don't want to pay him any more than this amount uh, left on his contract. So whether it's like July 1st or something like that, like a halfway point, um, you know, maybe there's something to that extent to where like gets just doesn't have the ability to fire him yet. Even if they wouldn't be like necessarily hiring somebody to replace him like yeah it would be just dead money either way but still like at least for half of the remainder of the season i imagine be charlie montoyo some like minor league coach gets called up to be in the dugout to do something and they go from there but i i think it would have to be either like a you know mike matheny like players are doing some hazing or borderline uh objectionable finable a uh, suspendable activity in the clubhouse and they have Grafol's uh express consent for doing it uh it would have to be something like that or like you know to and then kind of working her away from less severe 
it would have to be something along the lines of him getting in the way of playing somebody that gets wants to see him play. Like, let's say Lenin Sosa is thoroughly in Pedro Grifol's doghouse and Get says, we really want to have an answer on this guy by the end of the year. Uh, I don't think it's the case. I imagine they've seen enough from Sosa where they don't necessarily uh, believe he's anything. But let's just use him as an example. Um, that might be something to where they say like, well, we need Griffel out of here just so we can get the answers we need for the players that we want to see played. We can put more of a mandate on Charlie Montoya or whoever the next manager is going to be interim wise to play those guys. Like I could see that being another area where, you know, Griffel has to go in order to make use of whatever's left of the season. But until then, like, I think it's kind of just like bowing or not even bowing because the pressure I think is legit and real for Griffel to be fired, but it just had to be something like, yeah, we need a head on a pike. Basically, <laughs> we need something to show for our dissatisfaction, the status quo and Griffel has to be it because there are no answers. I think that's the, the one defense about what you can say about Griffel is like, yeah, I think the only thing he can improve is his unwillingness to call anybody out, especially veterans. Um, like, say, Andrew Benintendi, for example. I think like he might be the the flashpoint of Griffol's existence right now in his unwillingness to call out any veteran the way he calls out rookies. And just the either the effort he's giving or like in the case of not calling off Paul DeYoung on a pop-up that he should have caught and he just peeling off and letting DeYoung hang out to dry. That's a case where like Griffol has two answers when a veteran screws up like that. He either defends him, says like, well, the work ethic's there. He just made a mistake. We'll address it. And he never addresses it. Or he says, if something was wrong and he doesn't want to admit it's wrong, he says, I haven't talked to that player yet. Or I haven't gotten their word. Like he should have talked to him. Like he should be talking to Paul DeYoung before Paul DeYoung talks to the media. Uh, because, you know, the, the, the White Sox reporters got DeYoung's version of it before they heard from Griffol and Griffol just you know, didn't want to like say he knew anything kind of just uh, stuck his head in the sand but those are his two answers and I think that's really unhelpful at this point just if you're trying to convey addressing it and you don't address it like the results say you don't address it and also like your proof you're not showing and you're also not even telling when it comes to uh fans and the public saying I'm aware that this player screwed up, uh, you know, in a, you know, I'm not, I'm not throwing him under the bus. Like I'm acknowledging a mistake he made and expecting better. Like he never even gets to that with a veteran player. So I think that's the kind of thing where if this season wears on and Ben and is the guy that has to be played, but he's just putting forth an awful effort and you never name it. Uh, that could be another thing to where like, you know, gets just eventually says like, I don't know what this guy has to offer in the dugout. Let's move on. Yeah. Pedro Grafal was hired because the White Sox thought at that time, Rick Hahn, that he could help get the existing veterans to play together better, to be more fundamentally, fundamentally sound, to improve upon an 81 and 81 record from the previous season. He failed. Grafal did spectacularly with that job and that task. It said the White Sox lost 20 more games. And here we are talking about a three and 22 White Sox team that was supposed to be better defensively. That was supposed to be better on the run prevention side. Supposedly he has this new process called fast that they were going to implement and play baseball the right way. I hate that phrase. The only right way to play baseball is score more runs than your opponent. That's the only way. There are many ways you could do that, and you can be creative as much as you want, but that's really the only right way to play the game of baseball, alas. And Grafal's failing at that. I just don't get it. I don't get why you continue to carry him on when you already have an experienced manager as bench coach when you can make this easy transition. Yes, you can make the case that, well, Grafal can't make it any worse because <laughs> it's already awful. But I have zero faith that Grafal can make this any better and get, can write this ship to respectability. I mean, I, I kind of feel like this is an insult to the rest of Major League Baseball, Jim. Like Jerry Reinstorf should apologize to the other 29 MLB owners 
for how bad his baseball team is. Like this is, this is embarrassing. And our best friend Dan Zaborski over at Fangraphs, he wrote a column, the road to 120 losses for the White Sox, and his projection system zips now gives this 2024 White Sox team a 43% chance to set the new worst winning percentage in franchise history, which is 325 back in 1932. 43% high. That's a high rate for the White Sox to accomplish the worst season in franchise history. And in that column, Zimborski asks Jim, does it matter if the White Sox lose this many games? Will anything truly change for the Chicago White Sox to avoid another disaster season that they are suffering after a disastrous 2023 and now a worse 2024 season? And I think it's a good question, Jim. Maybe it's too early to try to answer it. But this does circle back again to his upcoming media scrum, Chris Getz, before the homestand. And pressing Chris Getz, what exactly is the game plan here? Because this ain't it. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two. I've seen two projections. One is that Fangraphs, uh, or at least Zips, has like the White Sox finishing at 54 and 108 based on the way they've played so far. And that was my preseason projection, or, or prediction, I should say, was 108 losses. Uh, Tom Tango, who is one of the... Uh, heads of StatCast and like a, a, a long time uh, uh, analytics expert. He has like in his own like simple method for just kind of regressing uh, for 162 games based on the way a team starts. And he has the White Sox finishing at 59 and 103. Uh, or sorry, he has them at uh, 16 and 102. Uh, and he had that with the Reds last year, two years ago, I think when they started three and 22 and he got the Reds record pr- pretty much right at 60 wins. So, like, that's just a simple regression, but still, like, you know, 59, 60 wins uh, for that uh, method. So, I think that's kind of, like, the most likely at this point. And if they get there, then I think it's a matter of, well, we still have Colson Montgomery, Edgar Caro, Brian Rallis, the farm system. Like, everything else is still intact. Uh, if they win, like, mid to high 50s, it just, I think that's within a standard deviation of how bad they were expected to be this year. I know Steve Stone said 10 wins better than last year. And, you know, some who were buying the clubhouse, you know, being such a drag on the White Sox potential, were saying that they're going to be better. Uh, I just, you know, seeing the same culprits of just who was unavailable to play and how much was riding on them. Like, I just thought, like, if the worst case scenario is going to happen, this is the year for the worst case scenario to happen. And just so happens to be there right now, the worst case scenario is even worse than 108 losses, which I was kind of baking into, like being like a 90th percentile kind of bad. Um, But if they are like, say, 120 loss or like record setting kind of bad. Yeah, I mean, the bullet is already gone that, you know, Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams are fired. Oh, yeah. Griffol is a much smaller bullet. So either there has to be a whole lot more spending and not even like spending in the way of like, you know, Bryce Harper, like contract or Juan Soto when he comes available, like it's going to be like a multi-year process, but just, you know, now that certain contracts are off the books, they have to be pivoting to something better more exciting, more transactional, uh, younger players, players with upside, et cetera. Like, you know, basing this whole thing on playing fast, run prevention, older guys, like when Lenin Sosa or Nick Nestrini are the youngest guys on the field and they're 24, uh, that's not young. I mean, it is for me, but I mean, like in terms of just when you're looking at upside and allowing players to fail and still having hope, like if they're 22 and they struggle, no big deal because they have at least like one full season to figure it out. When you're 24 and you're swinging and missing on your third attempt to stick in the majors, that's quite older than even like, you know, 24, third time in the majors would, you know, imply. So that's like what I think the White Sox have to be. And there are no easy answers. Like there's, it's all talk. I mean, like Griffel is all talk. Like last September, he said that the, you know, you should wait a couple weeks and then make up your mind and what you think the 2024 White Sox are going to be up until that point. Uh, he's not going to say anything because it's just going to be talk. And then, yeah, 
two weeks happens, the White Sox are the worst team in the baseball and looking every bit the part of it. And Griffel is still saying, well, you know, we're trying hard, we're addressing, etc." And he's, he has nothing new to say. So like Getz will have nothing new to say. Reinsdorf, you can just, you know, everybody, when his close friends say nobody wants to win more, you can roll your eyes and, and laugh it off and just say that everybody's being lied to and, and feel okay about saying it because it does get to be uh, that much of an affront to everybody's uh, um, sensibilities. But yeah, the big bullets are already spent and uh, it's going to be like probably an end of 2025 window for gets his work to be shown. And what he's shown so far is nothing. On SoxMachine.com, I posted the first mock draft for the upcoming 2024 MLB draft. And this draft carries more importance to the Chicago White Sox with like every press scene week. And it shouldn't be the case, right? They should have some type of idea and clarity what their game plan is and who they're building around as far as the future core. But with how bad things have gotten, it does raise the question, like if you're trying to build around Luis Robert to get back into contention, well, you only have Luis Robert for three more seasons. So that influences the type of player that you select fifth overall in July, hoping that player could quickly rise through your farm system to join the major league club and provide immediate impact that we're hoping that Colson Montgomery, Brian Ramos and Edgar Caro can do. In addition, Chris Getz needs to make some savvy free agent signings. And I, I don't know what he could possibly trade at this moment to continue building around Luis Robert, right? On, on the, especially on the position player front, because we've been harping on this for years, Jim, and it is really blown up in the white Sox faces. Now, the position players is just a complete mess. Infield, outfield, I don't care. Everything's a mess right now for the Chicago White Sox. Mm -hmm. But everybody keeps saying it comes down to Jerry Reinsdorf, and we know that Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't have the appetite to spend the necessary cash at free agency. So my concern is, moving forward, like this start has gotten so bad. For me, it invites the question, is it Luis Robert that the White Sox have to start planning to build around? Or is it Colson Montgomery? Is this more of a Pittsburgh Pirates rebuild where it's going to take five years because the White Sox don't have the cash, supposedly, to be big spenders in free agency to buy themselves out of this mess like the Texas Rangers did last year uh, or years previous, and they obviously won the world series last year. So paid out dividends or the 2003 tigers. Yeah. The 2003 tigers to 2006 Mags hits that walk off Homer and they're in the world series. The tigers spent out of their mess. If Jerry's not mm -hmm. willing to spend out of their, out of the mess, then you got to draft. You got to crush the international signings and you got to develop internally. That's the pirate system, Jim. And it's taken the pirates. No offense to them forever to get back to just being a 500 no team. offense <laughs> yeah feel free to offend them uh their owner is terrible too i don't want to offend pirates fans because they're good people but they've been through hell yeah. like th this is how bad of a story no, we're, we're, we're we're only offending bob nutting bob nutting yeah so, screw you bob nutting yeah that's what this invites now like i don't know what the game plan is for the white Sox moving forward and people ask us this question all the time next week I'll be on six over the score. Dan and Lawrence can ask me, what is the White Sox game plan? And I can't go on a radio station and say, I've got no idea. Like, that's my job. That's our job. Our job is to answer that question and speculate and analyze what could possibly be the best route for the Chicago White Sox to get back into contention. It might be five years. And then Colson Montgomery is in arbitration. Like, that's how long it could be. And this whole stadium is, oh my gosh. Like, that that's how bad this has gotten. It's, it's not only bad short term, it could really have consequences long term as well. Well, also saying, I don't know, is James's bit. Uh, like, oftentimes, like... <laughs> They ask him a long, uh, you know, leading question with a whole bunch of rants in between and their silence. And James asks if there was a question or I don't know, or you got me <laughs> and they all laugh and, and move on. So yeah, we can't step on his bit. Well, we can. I have noticed that he also has transitioned his bit over to our show. <laughs> I am learning James. I am learning, but yeah, that's just, that's how I feel. And like with Chris gets 
presser. I think it's going to be a bunch of nothing. But man, the screws need to be tightened on Chris Getz here. And I don't think he was a... I think he probably thought his honeymoon period would be a lot longer uh, than what he was given, but that's gone. And the reality is, is like, as Dan Zaborski wrote at Fangraphs, chances are good you're going to set a new worst record in franchise history. And you could be on the road to 120 losses in your first full season as general manager of Major League Baseball. Like, he cannot be happy. He cannot be happy about how things have unfolded. And that's why I think you got a veteran manager as your bench coach. Make the swap and see that create some type of spark. Where is spark is much needed. The White Sox have an Andrew problem. Mm -hmm. Now, Jim talked about the problems with Andrew Benatendi. This is so pathetic. Andrew Benatendi is hitting 165 with a 202 on base percentage. So he's not walking. And he's slugging 188. He's got two extra base hits. He's got two doubles. Andrew Vaughn, somehow, after a couple weeks ago, I suggested that the White Sox option him to Charlotte so he could regain some confidence, is hitting worse. He's now hitting 170 with a 255 with a 255 on base percentage and slugging just 216. Andrew Vaughn doesn't have a home run. We're 25 games into the season. And the Chicago White Sox first baseman doesn't have a home run. He only has four doubles. You talked about Ben attending what the White Sox could possibly do. My suggestions, I'm going to stick with this, Jim. Vaughn to Charlotte, just to give him some confidence, man. Learn what it's like to hit a, hit a home run, right? Just to get good vibes back. I'm not expecting him to be there very long, but he needs to go somewhere where the difficulty is dropped down, like I will be the show and just enjoy hitting the baseball play Gavin sheets at first base every day. And Tommy Pham is going to be ready to join the white Sox soon. And that opens up a corner outfield spot for Tommy Pham. Ben attendee. Do you make him the fourth outfielder? But when you look at the white Sox outfielders, when they're hitting Robbie Grossman's got a 526 OPS and that's, heavily carried by his 322 on base percentage. He's just a singles and walks guy. There's no power whatsoever in Robbie Grossman's bat. He is swinging a balsa wood bat at the plate. Dominic Fletcher, my guy, he's struggling. He's got a 548 OPS, 277 on base percentage, slugging just 271. And then Kevin Pillar, he had a home run in this series against the Twins. He's got a 290 on base percentage and slugging 360. So that's a 650 OPS out of Grossman, Fletcher, and Pilar. Pilar's hitting the best out of those three. So if you put Tommy Pham in a corner spot, I'm assuming Dominic Fletcher still has to play in center field. And then you're deciding between Grossman and Ben Attendi and who's going to be that third outfielder. That would be my direction, but I know that it doesn't really solve the outfield situation, which is a bunch of veterans that a rookie in Dominic Fletcher and the veterans for some reason have just fallen off a cliff and forgot how to hit a baseball. Yeah. I'm looking at the last seven days for white Sox outfielders. OPS wise, Kevin Pillar leads the group at five eighteen, uh, the Albany area code five one eight. Uh, and he's one for 11. Just the one hit happens to be a homer. So he's got a five eighteen OPS Robbie Grossman five seventeen, but the walks have dried up. Like he got, uh, a whole lot of walks early on only one walk in his last four games. So it seems like opponents are onto him being like, Oh, may as well see how far I can hit the baseball and, uh, and, right. and attack, attack, attack. Uh, Fletcher's at 321. Ben at 318. So that's what we're looking at right now. Ben Tendi gets benched for one game and then he pinch hits and plays center field. Uh, so it's, you know, yeah, it's a case of when it looks like there might be consequences or accountability for poor play and a poor play. Uh, it turns out like, oh, nope, he was just not even getting the day off or not even getting a message, message sent. He's now uh, pinch hitting and playing out of position. So that's great. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, what was that outfield configuration? Benetendi and Setter, Grossman and Sheets? Uh, yes, I believe. Yes. Um, yeah, Sheets definitely in right. And I think, you know, Sheets, when it comes to how much right field he has to play, that's kind of my litmus test for just how bad things are going. 
because the White Sox seemed hell bent on not having him play right field, except maybe an only spot duty or pinch hitting type situations where the bench gets shuffled and he has to go out there in the 10th inning because they've used pinch runners and such. And now he's playing right field most of the time again. And that shows like the cluster failure that's happened and no offense to sheets, like who's playing well, but you know, as you mentioned with the Vaughn, right. you know, he should be playing first base. Like it's a case of uh, the white Sox having a couple uh players to, uh, make, I guess, not necessarily ultimatums on or anything like that, but just uh, I, I think those are the first steps for like any kind of sea changes coming to the White Sox are whether the statuses of Benintendi and Vaughn are affected in any way. And I think that would be like a, a good first place to start because when I think about like Getz and how like his entire MO for building a team has already blown up in his face three weeks in the season. Like that doesn't give you a whole lot of faith that he knows what he's doing. But every time I think, well, even Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams weren't that bad. You look at the Ben and Hendy contract and you look at Vaughn being rushed through the majors and considered uh, untouchable. And you think, what the hell were they seeing there? So I mean, like I, I wrestled back and forth in terms of like who would be or where the team would be better off if Han and Williams are still there. And I'm just thinking like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a thoroughly uh borked situation either way. But um, yeah, Ben and Tendi is just, uh, that, that's kind of sticking out to me more in terms of just Griffol's willingness to upset a veteran and uh, the White Sox willingness to say like, yeah, we're going to, I already think about eating this contract. First, we're going to send a message about his playing time and really, you know, give Tommy Pham a, a chance to bury him. Dominic Fletcher and Kevin Pillar a chance to bury him. Uh, and Ben Intendi has to play his way back in the mix. But now you're talking about like three years left in a contract after the season. And like, do you cut him then? And how much money will Jerry Reinsdorf eat? Even if Ben Intendi is that bad, but I'm just happy that uh, this give some relief to those who considered Yasmani Grandal the worst free agent contract in White Sox history because it clearly wasn't uh, because through two years, it was fine. Like Adam Dunn through two years, terrible. Uh, Jamie Navarro through one year, terrible. Like, you know, those are the two I go to that were worse than Grandal. And, you know, Grandal just happened to be a 30-something catcher where, you know, uh, things can happen fast. And all of a sudden his knees and back stop working and he ends up where he ends up. But like Ben and Tendi, when that contract was handed out, you're thinking like this guy is the highest paid free agent in White Sox history in franchise history. Uh, independent analysts, objective uh, third parties who don't have any reason to knock the White Sox are saying like, wait, this White Sox has never spent more than they're spending on Andrew Ben and Tendi. Why is this guy, the guy they're selling out for? And then in, you know, First year's a disaster. Second year, even worse. And now you're staring at three years left. And so, yeah, this is already, uh, I think, the clubhouse leader right now for the worst free agent contract the White Sox have ever signed. And uh, I, I think I'm just waiting to see when it comes to Ben Tendi and Vaughn, the first signs that they're considering the positions that they play, uh, the futures of them beyond Ben and Tendi and Vaughn because they should be like, it should be pretty much an open contest uh, with uh, just the fact that they're not premium positions. They're towards the easier end of the defensive spectrum. They should be bet first. Uh, and right now you're getting nothing in either direction, defense or hitting from them. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. 
That's indeed.com slash blue wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. <laughs> Philip has just lost the respect of the youth league football team he coaches. He was asked what New England should do in the draft, and his answer was objectively terrible. The Athletic just wrote a great article about this, but Philip doesn't have the Athletic or the respect of a boisterous group of 11-year-olds who once looked up to him. Learn from Philip's error, get the Athletic, and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. Your first baseman's got to hit more than 25 homers a season. Period. Period. Your left fielder should be hitting 20 to 30 homers a season. Not this. And raises the question, Jim, what if Andrew Vaughn does it bounce back? Like, what do the White Sox do with Vaughn with the amount of control they still have for him? Seems like like a change of scenery trade. Like, there might be some other team that's interested that might have had some eyes on him during draft day or might have been following him saying, like, oh, if he is ever available in trade, I will try to lowball the White Sox because I think we can fix him, or at least I think he's worth putting a few months of work into him to see what happens. Uh, but that's kind of where they're at. Um, yeah, just I, I never understood why they considered him untouchable. Yeah, again, my suggestions. Put Gavin Sheets at first base, option Vaughn to Charlotte, call up Tommy Pham, and hopefully Pham starts hitting right away because none of the White Sox outfielders are hitting. It's really hard to come up with a lineup of respectable hitters when you only have three league average or better hitters right now on your roster. But if Grafal's still the manager, <clears throat> you can't keep batting Vaughn and Ben Attendee fourth and fifth in this lineup. You just can't. There's no power right now. They're not producing. You got to do something else. Drop them in the order or don't play them, uh, as I'm suggesting right now. That's how bad the Andrew problem. So let's look ahead to the next series for the Chicago White Sox. As they come home, they now have a six-game homestand. Three against the Tampa Bay Rays, and they'll face the Minnesota Twins again early during the week. And the Tampa Bay Rays are 13-13 this season. They're four and a half games back. The New York Yankees in the American League East. A very pedestrian start for the Rays, especially compared to last year, where they were red hot out of the gate. They have lost six of their last 10 games. The pitching problems for this series, there could be some weather on Friday night. So pay attention to that, especially if you are planning on going to the game. It's a 6.40 p.m. Central Time start. Zach Eflin is making the start for the Rays. He's got a 3.68 ERA to start the season against Chris Flexen. First pitch temperature is projected to be 55 degrees. There's a 60% chance of rain. Saturday, 6.10 p.m. Central Time start. It'll be a beautiful day on Saturday. First pitch temperature projection is 77 degrees, so a hot day at the ballpark in late April. Aaron Savali will be making the start for the Rays against Jonathan Cannon. And then on Sunday at 1.10 p.m. Central Time, 70 degrees. Zach Littell, 3.33 ERA against Eric Fetty, which Fetty now has a season ERA of 2.73. And when it comes to this series, Jim, I think it's on Eric Fetty's shoulders if the White Sox can win a game. An interesting note, in his five starts, every Fetty start for the White Sox has been a one-run game. I wonder if that streak will continue for betting purposes for myself, but it does make those games more interesting to watch from a White Sox perspective. So I'm curious about Sunday. I think that's the best chance for the White Sox to win, especially with how well Fetty's been pitching. And we talked about this in a previous podcast episode. This is a free agent signing that's working for the White Sox that Chris Getz made. Yeah, we're seeing some of the progress we hope to see. Like, he'd kind of run out of gas in his last inning of work in his first couple starts, uh, struggling to get the third time through. And then this last time, he seemed to have, like, the arsenal or the ability to mix pitches or locate uh in a way that the other pitchers couldn't uh with the white Sox, you know getting in on lefties expanding the zone down in a way like working both sides of the plates up and down even though he has a sinker like still working at the top of the zone and avoiding like that down and in spot that uh you know Michael Kopech got victimized on Garrett Crochet got victimized on like you know Fetty seemed to have like the right idea for how to attack him like he used 
four pitches pretty much like and and you know use the top three pitches uh, pretty much equally or as equally as you're going to for uh, a pitcher of that kind of arsenal so I think that's what you want to see for a Fetty who can actually work three times through and not get all his swings and misses like first time through the lineup and then they realize like oh that's what the splitter looks like and now I know what to how to lay off it when uh, it looks like it's starting out thigh high so like I think that's uh, what you want to see from Fetty, and I think there is a learning curve from him, like coming from the KBO to major leagues or back to the major leagues and realizing like, oh yeah, the, the, a lot more homers here. A lot more guys uh, who have power on two strike counts and yeah, I can't afford to, um, you know, I have to be a lot more precise or at least my misses have to be a lot bigger or on one side of the plate uh, than they were in the KBO. So I think he is you know, showing what he needs to show in terms of early intrigue and also some progress Uh, with Jonathan Cannon. Like there were some successes against the twins, like, but there are also some innings or like locations that got away from him, you know, not really wanting to work inside. So I think that was hopefully a teachable moment and not a case of him running up against his limitations right away. More long lines like, oh, that's the difference between minor league hitters and major league hitters is I really have to get in the hands of lefty bats. So like I'm interested to see if he makes adjustments or if it's a case where he just can't quite make those adjustments right now. Chris Flexen is just Are kind of Are you surprised like, he's getting a third start when the White Sox option Nick Destrini? No, I I could see it being either one. Um, I think it's probably just a matter of timing and maybe when it comes to Cannon, he's more of a strike thrower. Uh, and that might be the difference right now is Nestrini. He walked five and three innings. He's somebody who, when his mechanics are out of whack or if he's not feeling it, the walks pile up, the pitches pile up. And he shortens his own nights. Whereas Cannon, when he fails, it tends to be because he misses in the zone. The hitters have to earn it. And that might be, you know, besides the fact of like, you know, this is just how the timing is working out right now. His every five day schedule is a lot more favorable to him staying in the majors versus Nestrini's every five days, you know, where he's throwing. But they just might want to find strike throwers like they have this supposedly better defense. Uh, They may as well use that. Fewer pitches uh, means like, you know, more innings from the starter, fewer innings from bullpen that might be already taxed. Like Tanner Banks has had to come into a lot of games in the middle innings to try to throw uh, a couple. So they might figure a cannon, somebody who can luck into five innings a lot more easily than Nestrini can against quality competition. But uh, I think it's probably a coin flip. And if the roles were flipped to where like cannon was up first and Nestrini came up later and they were on the same schedule, it might be the same same outcome for each individual pitcher to where like, you know, Cannon is the one that's optioned because like they just wanted a bullpen arm faster than his next start was going to come up. And Nestrini is the guy getting extra starts. But I think given the problems they'll have staffing the rotation, um, you know, I'm not worried about Nestrini's option. I think it's a case of like, he'll he'll still get his chances uh and uh he'll get a lot of uh probably opportunities to frustrate white Sox fans and say like why can't he throw strikes because i think it will be a longer curve for him to uh figure it out just because of his you know natural uh issues right now repeating his delivery so we'll continue playing this game over under total runs for the white Sox in this three game series against the rays i'm going to set it at seven and a half runs for three games jib can the White Sox score eight or more runs in three games against the Rays? I'm going to say over. Oh, all right. I'm going to take the under. Okay. <laughs> Not by a lot, I but I just figure do. like they're due for their win uh, because uh, if you've been following uh, uh, her Lawrence on Twitter, he's been tracking the pattern of like, they lose four games, win a game, lose five games, win a game, lose six games, win a game, lose seven games. So they should win a game which would snap their opening every series with a shutout. They've been outscored, I think, 51-2 to two in series openers. Uh, so, like, uh, you'll see two trends, uh, you know, colliding here between the White Sox uh, being owed a win because uh, they have to reset the loss counter or uh, they're going to get shut out again in the first game and, and run up that just absurd 51-2. to two. In just, opening games of series. What do you think that is? Just not being prepared or just weird luck? Both. 
Um, it could be a case of like, you know, it, there is some uh, amount of luck, but it could also be just uh, the White Sox might be other teams. Yeah, I, I said it online, like on Twitter. And it seems like you know, the White Sox are like a rehab stint for teams, like kind of like in between, like a halfway house between minor leagues and major leagues. Like, like Nick Castellanos is struggling. Here's a three hit game. Max Kepler is injured coming off a of DL. Here's a, you know, a, a quick two games and, you know, even a really a, a loud outs in, in, you know, a game where he was held in check. Uh yeah, people, you know, people are really impressed by the Phillies rotation. Yeah, they face the White Sox. People are really impressed by what the Royals and Tigers are doing. Yeah, they played the White Sox. Like everybody in the AL Central that's currently like over 500, like they can pretty much thank their record against the White Sox for providing that margin. So uh, they make a lot of teams look better. So it could be a case of just um, them being overwhelmed and perhaps just other teams being like, oh, this is, this is a relief facing this quality of pitching, this caliber of defense this lack of offense and we're just going to play free and easy because we just got done with a tough series and we need uh yeah there is no such thing as a trap series i think when it comes to the white Sox, they're they're just kind of like a a bounce back they're they're rebound basically and uh, uh teams are taking full advantage of it right now we'll see how the white Sox do we'll recap that series at our next podcast on monday morning hopefully the white Sox do win a game and they could stop this uh, awful, awful first game streak of series. 51-2. My Lord. My Lord. So, ending this podcast, let's look for hope, right? We've been pretty dour, pretty skeptical. I'm calling for the firing of Pedro Grafal. Everything is falling apart for the Chicago White Sox. Where can White Sox fans look for hope? And that's down in Birmingham, Alabama. To start the season, the Barons... Just won again Thursday night. They have won seven straight games. The Barons are 13-5 and five in first place in their division. The reason why this is important, the last time the Birmingham Barons went to the postseason was 2013. That poor city, that poor community has seen really bad baseball for like a decade. And now they have a really good team, and it's led by Edgar Caro, which before Thursday's game, he already has five home runs this season and 20 RBIs. He's hitting almost 300. He's slugging well over 600. Brooks Baldwin, somebody that we're learning more about, is hitting over 400 to start the season. Duke Ellis has no extra base hits, but he's 16 of 17 in stolen base attempts. And Brian Ramos was the weak point hitting-wise. He was batting under 100 to start the season. But Thursday night, he hit his first home run of the season, a two-run shot that was pretty clutch, helping the Barons win. And on the pitching front, that trade with the Padres, I mean, it's looking great so far for the White Sox. It's also looking great for the Padres. Still in season has been awesome. Drew Thorpe, Jairo Iriarte, these guys have been lights out. Combined, those two have only allowed two earned runs. Iriarte hasn't allowed an earned run. He's only allowed one unearned run. And even Kai Bush has been pitching well. So, Jim, is this where we can pitch the idea that at some point, if White Sox fans get too frustrated and they say, I don't want to watch the Major League Baseball team, we could advocate now, go watch the Barons because they're playing good baseball. Yeah, I, I kind of stuck my neck out a little bit after the first weekend of the series when they uh, swept Chattanooga to open the season and talking to Sergio Santos and uh, the coaching staff and talking around uh, the ballpark. There is a theme like, yeah, we got a good team, uh, you know. We like the way this roster fits together. And, you know, I you know, talked to them. So I, I said I saw the same thing. And so I wrote a post about it saying uh, that the Barons like this is their best chance to have like a a winning record, like an oasis of success in the organization. And Nicky Delmonico told me that like he hopes that they'll keep it together for a bit just because like Brian Ramos, the one that you know we talked about. And I mentioned like, why is Ramos in double A to start the season. Like Colson Montgomery got promoted to triple A Ramos outplayed Montgomery last year. There's a case for him to be called up. Like if he were starting the season in Charlotte, you could say, yeah, I, I get it. Uh, it's not like a huge, uh, 
problem or, you know, kind of a sign that Ramos started the year in double A, he could flip a coin. But I just wondered, you know, given how well he finished the season, um, you know, is there any point to him staying here? And I, I think, you know, Delmonico said that, you know, first of all, it's a matter of getting at bats and they just might have had some infield issues to work out in Charlotte. But also, like uh, he said, that we, we think it's a special group and we just want them to play together for a bit. And that kind of stuck out to me. John Eli said the same thing, talking about the pitching staff and how it's like a pretty good one through five and saying like they all feed off each other. And Sergio Santos, who's the new manager, and he had a, a title and a postseason appearance in his two years coaching the Yankees low minors teams. He said that like winning is a big deal. Like it's not like shouldn't be the only thing or the priority, but it's like a byproduct of a, a farm system that's developing, right? That you do see wins happening. So he'd like to see some wins and he likes the way the team's starting so far. And so you know, I wrote about like saying like, yeah, everybody thinks, seems to think they can win some games. I think they can win some too. And then, you know, whenever you say that about a White Sox affiliate, you have the chance of looking really stupid uh, just because either yeah, the bottom falls out, the pitchers don't develop, somebody gets hurt, or just emergencies at the major league level or Charlotte forces upwards, the team fractures, and suddenly, like, you know, the the the, the uh, t- dispersal of talent just causes every affiliate to be mediocre at best. Um, but so far, like, yeah, I, I think we're past the jinx part of me uh, saying this because I wrote it when they were 3-0 and now they're 13-5. and So I feel like, you know, I can't be blamed uh, for this falling apart or having a bad read. Um, yeah, Brooks Baldwin, when another one I wrote about just saying like, you know, I'd, I've been fascinated by this guy. Nobody knows who he is. So I don't want to like jump out of limb and call him a top 10 prospect, but I'm going to write about him in an honorable mention because... He hasn't done anything wrong over the last half year of baseball to uh, yeah, make you uh, think like, oh, he's not a guy. And now he's hitting, what, 453? So like, uh, my <laughs> early reads in uh, Birmingham are feeling pretty good right now, Ramos aside. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting test in terms of how long they keep it together to try to preserve this like winning nucleus thing. Um, also whether like some pitchers go directly to Charlotte, like Drew Thorpe, does he spend any time in Charlotte or does he go straight to Chicago because Charlotte's hell on pitchers and like Thorpe, uh, like the day I always call it the Davis Martin plan, just, you know, going to Chicago, heading back to Charlotte, pitching worse in Charlotte than he did in Chicago and the White Sox thinking nothing of it and calling him right back as soon as they had a need because they figured like, yeah, we trust the stuff. Uh, his, his metrics are where they need him to be. His pitches are performing the way they need to perform. Uh, we don't worry about his home numbers at Charlotte because it's just awful to pitch there. So there's that element as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm fascinated by the Barons as just a team. They fit really well together. The defense when it's left to right, uh, left would be Duke Ellis, Tatum in center or Burke in center and Tatum in right. That's like, a really fast outfield that covers a ton of ground. So they have the run prevention part down. It's pretty solid around the infield too. Like no, like Baldwin might be the weak link. And that's only because he hasn't played that much shortstop. Still figuring out like how good he is. Caro's good enough behind the plate. Like it's a really good team that fits together. So uh, I think they should be able to keep on this track. It's just more a matter of like, you know, do they make Drew Thorpe spend a whole half down there? Or do they make, you know, Brian Ramos or Edgar Caro, if they heat up or they start living up to their prospect billing, do they spend a whole half down there? Um, That's going to be, I think, going to be like, although the White Sox guests are so bad, I I think that you made me make that argument. The White Sox being 3-22 and bad probably makes you think like, keep the Barons away from them. Like, set up a firewall. Um, <laughs> nobody wants to see contamination down below. So if Drew Thorpe spends a half a season racking up, like, the gaudiest numbers in double A because his changeup is just a pitch that Southern League hitters or any hitters coming up to that level have never seen, uh, then, you know, so be it because we just don't want to see emergencies in the 26-man roster affecting what looks like finally some pretty healthy – uh, a healthy cluster of player development that might be on similar timetables. We did get a couple of notes from our buddy, James Fegan speaking with new director of player development, Paul Yadish. Uh, Ramos just slumping needs to work on making those sh- stretches shorter. Cause he did have some bad months in wits and Salem and Canapolis too. Eric Caro. Awesome. But they're not going to rush him as he's building great rapport with Iriarte. 
And as you mentioned earlier, they're not afraid to promote from Birmingham directly. And maybe that's the idea because I can understand testing Thorpe to see how he does. Maybe if there's a series against the Norfolk Tide, the Baltimore Orioles system that's just been mashing to start the year, maybe you want to have him test to see if he can shut down that lineup before he joins the major leagues. But I have no problem the White Sox just want to skip Charlotte. Like, it's almost getting to the point which, why are they even in Charlotte? I know why they're in Charlotte. Great market that they don't take advantage of. I get why they're there. Direct flights from Chicago to Charlotte makes operations a lot easier. And it's a great stadium. Great stadium. Yeah, facilities, top notch. Yeah, they don't take advantage of it, though. Uh but yeah, I, I have no problem. The White Sox want to start promoting guys for Birmingham directly, but I'm okay with them playing out the first half and see if they can clinch the division. Because they could, if they could do that, then yeah, Birmingham Barons are going to have some postseason baseball to play in September, and that'll be the first time since 2013. And when you look at the White Sox minor league affiliates, the Charlotte Knights not bad. They're 10 at 13. Winston Salem's off to a tough start. They're 7 at 11. But Canapolis is 10 at 7. So Canapolis and Birmingham are carrying the load, but as an organization and the minor league affiliates together, the White Sox have a positive winning percentage. They're above 500. So maybe this idea, this grand plan that Chris Getz is trying to create with Josh Barfield and Brian Bannister, maybe they're starting to see some realization in Birmingham. We're not seeing it in Chicago, but again, as we mentioned earlier in this show, What's the long-term game plan and how do you take maybe some of the success that Birmingham is seeing and apply it to the major league club in Chicago? And does that plan even work? I think it all culminates in new White Sox manager, Sergio Santos. There you go with uh, Nicky Nicky as the hitting coach. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Bring it full circle, full circle. Well, that will do it for this episode of the Sox machine podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. Again, we'll have a new podcast for you guys on Monday. James will be joining us as we'll recap what happens against the Tampa Bay Rays and look ahead to the next series against the Minnesota Twins. And then, of course, in that episode, we'll take a look around Major League Baseball. Hit us up with what you guys think is interesting in the comments section. And, of course, you can help support us over at patreon.com slash machine. Believe it or not, and I love you guys. Thank you so much for your continued support. And welcome to all of the new supporters. Our Patreon base continues to grow, even how bad the Chicago White Sox are, Jim. And that warms my heart. Thank you guys so much for helping support us to keep the lights on. Support us to be able to send James out on the road to cover the road games in Minneapolis. This next road series... (laughs) Is going to be a all losses Louis. one day, Jim. All losses. Uh, we didn't promise him that he'd be covering games that the White Sox win on the road. <laughs> we just promised that we could send him on the road. His next series that he'll go on the road will be St. Louis to start the month of May. But thank you guys so much for signing up. And if you aren't a Patriot supporter, you could get gain full access to all of our coverage of the Chicago White Sox, starting just five dollars a month at patreon.com slash socks machine you can subscribe to the socks machine podcast wherever you listen to podcasts such as spotify and apple music if you are listening to us now on youtube because google podcasts went away welcome please subscribe to our youtube channel at youtube.com slash socks machine you can follow us on social media we're on all the platforms at socks machine you can follow me at socks machine underscore josh and of course follow james at jrv the Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Alongside Jim Margulis, I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants. They all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger 
for the ones who get it done.